Okay, so knowing those errors is very important because it might be frustrating, it might be a little irritating at the time. Ah, I got an error here, I gotta fix it, why can't I just see my scene? Well, it's important that you fix it so that you can see what you're supposed to be getting and not some mysterious, hidden error, broken version of what you intended. Even more so than that, if the scene has a flaw in it, it might play one way on your software, but not play the same way on another piece of software in another browser. The specification tells implementers, here's how things work. It doesn't say, here's what to do when they don't work. We're, we're almost silent on that. You know, they say, well, report an error if it's broken, but what's the correct way to do something erroneous? You could spend a lot of time defining that. We don't. We say, do the right thing or stop. Okay, final benefit of this, in knowing the errors in advance, is you are the scene author. You know what it's supposed to look like. You can fix it. What about the end user who gets this thing and he's just getting something that's wrong? and there's no indication that it's wrong. He thinks, well, that's the way it really is. Or, I must be dumb, I must be stupid, it doesn't work for me. So we don't want those hidden errors. We tell you right up front, fix the data types, match it going in, I can't change the color to position 83, 12, 97. There is no color for that. I can't change a true-false to an orientation 30 degrees around the x-axis. It makes no sense. So we say, stop. If you are putting a value in, it must be the right data type, or it doesn't work. Okay, so X3D is strongly typed. Uh, decryption of those things, so an SF bool means single field Boolean value. value. Uh, MF color means an array of color values. Each color is red, green, or blue, RGB values. Those values are from 0 to 1 each, not 0 to 255, etc., etc. And so there is a rich set of different data types. We have uh, integers, and floats, and doubles, and arrays of integers, floats, and doubles. And we have a rotation type which is an axis angle. Uh, we have strings, we have arrays of strings, and we have time values, values, time hacks about when something would work. And then we have arrays of arrays, uh, two tuples, three tuples, four tuples, where we know there must be a certain number of values for the combination of uh, the array to work. A little bit of a syntax note. Uh, the differences between Classic Vermal and X3D are just a few. Uh, here's one of the main ones. True and false is how the Classic Vermal syntax works, because that's the way it always was. But in XML, we use lowercase true and false rather than capitalized. Why? Because that's how XML works. Similarly, brackets are needed in, are needed in Classic Vermal, but they're not needed in the uh, XML encoding, and XML allows other things to happen, like instead of an ampersand sign, you might put ampersand AMP semicolon. Those things become pretty well familiar to HTML authors and XML authors, uh, so it's not a big step for the, uh, if you're coming from the verbal perspective, how would you use those. And that's a pretty short list. There are a few other gotchas here and there, but it's essentially identical. Here's another important part of the language design in X3D. Many languages have types, just as we've seen. Some languages don't have many types. They must, might just treat everything as a string. But we treat them as uh, strongly typed variables. However, Something where we're a little stricter than other languages is uh, access type. Because we're so intent upon getting great performance, we carefully control whether 
a value is persistent or not. Some values are only allowed to be set at initialization time. The reason for that is the browser might do all sorts of computation with it and turn it into another structure for higher performance. So we might not expose that value to the author once something has been created and instead say, if you want to change that, restart that particular piece of geometry or whatever it is. But that's when we're being strict. Most of the times we're pretty open about things and we want it to be as flexible as possible. So you'll, you'll find that most fields tend to be input-output, meaning you can either set them or you can get them. You can put an uh, input value into it or get an output value from it. And then occasionally we, uh, we have input-only fields or output-only fields in combination with these things so that modifications can be carefully uh, controlled in the scene graph and we don't try to change something in the scene graph that doesn't make sense. Okay, uh, how does this work? Well, it's uh, one of those things where if you do it wrong, it's an error. So don't do it wrong, do it right. Um, it's good to know that you have an error in advance. We've talked about that. As the tools get smarter, uh, you'll find, in fact, that X3D Edit goes pretty far down the road to make sure that you're only offered choices that are legal, and this guides you into putting things together the right way. One of the few differences, Verbal 97 X3D appears right here in access type. Uh, we did change the naming a little bit. It used to be called, uh, the nomenclature was event in, event out, field and exposed field, which are perfectly good names uh, in isolation. They are functionally descriptive if you read the definitions, but since they're used in combination with in a sentence with phrases like, well, this event and that event, this field and that field, we found that it was very hard to be <laughs> descriptive talking about these because the jargon was too close and we stepped on each other's toes all the time. So instead we changed the names to be distinct from the notion of what is a field and what is an event. And I think the new names are better, they're more descriptive uh, without being confusing. So input only, output only, input output, and initialize only. Finally, the third comparison on jargon that was unchanged, and that's the specification nomenclature. We use this uh, completely obscure in, out, empty bracket, and in, comma, out. Don't get me started. I told everybody we should change that, but they were too wedded to um, how they do business. So, like it or not, we still got that nomenclature. Uh, and at least you can understand it. The main thing is the X3D names are much clearer. They do hold true in the class of Vermal. X3D 3.01, 3.2 no, uh, scenes, so use the new names right here. What else did we do? Well, as it turned out, in Vermal 97, uh, not only were the data, was the data type, but there's also really an object model, an object-oriented way of structuring the different constructs of how do the pieces of a scene graph influence each other in design? As it turns out, it was pretty object-oriented, but not completely, meaning there were a few rough edges and incomplete parts in Vermal 97. So as part of our, our technical rigor in X3D, we went ahead and fully structured the object model type to bottom. We created abstract node types and this means that similar nodes, nodes with similar functionality in X3D, have an exact same template that they follow, the extract, abstract node types. So there's no inconsistencies the way this node and that node might do it. So it has lots of benefits. Some of the go-forward benefits are that uh, if you're defining new nodes or future specifications, uh, future specification capabilities, we can extend the language consistently and coherently, and it, it's not subjective anymore, it's objective 
it's object oriented, it's well defined, it works. Something else we added in X3D was XML. We didn't have that before. So could we map the scene graph into the XML documentation? Yes, indeed we can. And this is why uh, the web, uh, this, this makes X3D a first class web citizen, not just yet another file format out there. Uh, it's important to note that uh, XML by itself is not really a language as much as it is a language for writing other languages. It's a pattern. It's a way of saying things in it that looks similar. But HTML and X3D, for example, are both written in XML. But they're both separate languages. Okay, so XML is perhaps the alphabet that we're using. X3D, HTML, other XML languages, these are the specific sets of words, the specific vocabularies for which element, which attribute are we allowed to put in our language. So, uh, bottom line, XML is great. <laughs> and it works very well with X3D. This XML stuff is so important that I recommend you take a look at this reference here. Uh, we look at this every single quarter here at NPS, Naval Post Graduate School. When we're studying X3D, when we're studying XML, there's a wonderful four-page document called XML in 10 points. And the reason for this document is XML does a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things out there. So this explains how they're put together, what does it mean, why, in a pretty concise way. You see the 10 points listed here. Uh, if you haven't read it, I recommend you do so. If you haven't read it recently, I recommend you read it again. Because each time we, we go through it, we get fresh or uh, refreshed insights into how it works. Here's a little more on XML. And this is sort of a XML 101 as it looks from an X3D perspective. The, uh, XML syntax is on the left here. We call it elements and attributes. This will be utterly familiar to any of you who've done HTML or other web language work. So our basic design pattern when we said how can we take X3D and line that up with XML and get these things to work? Well, here's our, here are our rules. We say X3D nodes are elements. The simple type, meaning integer, float, boolean, those values get mapped into attributes, XML, elements, and attributes. What else do we do? Parent-child relationships in uh, the scene graph are simply parent-child relationships of uh, the elements and the names, the labels of those are called container field. And about 96% of the time, 97% of the time, that's invisible and we don't even have to worry about it. We'll worry about it later when we get to those special cases. It does mean that our X3D is a little terser than it would be in verbal 97. Finally, uh, validation. This is the most important thing. I think, because XML validation means any number of tools can look at your X3D scene and say, is it right? Is it not? Did it work? Well, wow, that's cool that we get all of that error checking for free. Here's a little more data about that. Uh, it turns out there's uh, several levels of validation, several degrees of power on how close the checking could be. Well-formed means that it just follows the basic rules of the XML meta language, the language for other languages. Is it well formed? Does it have angle brackets, equal signs, quotes in the right place? Is the white space in the right place? Does it make sense? When we get down to is it correct for X3D, then we get to use a doc type or we get to use a schema where each of those can apply rules to it and say, 
All right, you might be well-formed XML, but are you also correctly structured for X3D? So this is why these different tools can help us so much in clearing up problems in our scene. That's something that you can't really do with the classic formal or the binary encoding just on their own. You need this kind of extra support for a sophisticated language to find those errors. And uh, you're probably already familiar, but here's an important term, garbage in, garbage out. It's very hard to pick through the garbage that came out and find out what was wrong going in. So all of this validation stuff helps us reduce the garbage in problem so that the garbage out problem hopefully goes away. Uh, we've definitely seen that our quality control has gone up tremendously when we worked to have XML. Okay, what else? Not that I want to say anything bad about it. The classic verbal encoding is, is just fine. It works. It gave us a steady upgrade path. It means all of our past content can still work with an X3D. We've got scenes here that are 10, 11, 12 years old, and they still work because they were written in Vermal 97, and Vermal 97 is part of X3D. I challenge others to match that statement. Sometimes we go through this exercise at big conferences, and it's, it's pretty interesting, actually. You could have 100, 200 people in the room, uh, and uh, you say, how many folks have are built 3D? And you know, every hand goes up, oh, sure, I, I built 3D. And how many folks have a model that's one year old? Oh, okay, and everybody's hand, most everybody, except for the newcomers, and, and, and they're like, well, I'm working on one. And, okay, okay. okay. How about, how many people have scenes that are two years old? Uh, some of the hands start going down. Three years old. Four years old. They mostly go, by the time you get to four or five years old, you have a percentage of the audience left with their hands still raised. And then you can keep going. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And guess what? They were all using the open standard. They can still use their content. The reason the others are timing out after two or three years is because, oh, the file, the company changed, or the API doesn't exist anymore, or that company got bought by another company and they changed how they do business, and I couldn't afford the tool, or the tool didn't work anymore, or it just didn't read, or pick your list of excuses. Sometimes people say, well, uh, I have a video of it, I could show, okay, well, thanks, you know, it's good, we, we respect your work, it's important, well, I just want to use it again. Having things in X3D means all of that content from Vermal and then X3D can, doesn't go away, it doesn't time out year to year, it's royalty free forever, usable by all of these different technologies. Okay. So, uh, given that they're all the same, please make the right decision. Uh, we're very confident that people will make the right choice, and there are good reasons to use classic thermal or compressed binary, or the XML.x3D file, or all of the above in different combinations. They're functionally equivalent, so we can have our cake and eat it too. Currently, we have uh, uh, an X3DB binary encoding. We just had our second implementation announced, a uh, C++ implementation by uh, EDF, Electricité de France. Uh, it's in their Paraview tool. XJ3D is the other uh, implementer, and they're in Java. So let's uh, update this slide here. Update in the last two weeks, Paraview. Well, I'm not doing spell checking there. The pen uh, is just a little bit off, obviously. But there you go. What are the two pieces of, uh, of uh, compression? Well, once is, one is information-centric, similar to zip or gzip. Can we squeeze the extra bytes out of there? The other compression is geometric. If we have coplanar polygons, can we turn them into one bigger polygon? If we have 17 colors that are pretty similar, 
can we reduce that to two or three colors without loss of visual quality? These are the types of things possible. Okay, so compressed binary encoding is very important. And work is ongoing. There's actually a new standard at W3C uh, undergoing uh, uh, development called EXI, Efficient XML Interchange. And our expectation, so sorry. Our expectation is that uh, when that's ready, we'll replace fast info set with EXI. And we won't lose any uh, past content because it's a very easy path on the compressed binary because all you have to do is convert it back to XML and go forward. So we're not worried about forward compatibility. We've got that all figured out. Okay, here's a little more uh, picture describing that binary uh, compression and how we can use it uh, not just to reduce the geometry but to add things like digital signature, encryption for privacy, fast info set data compression. So there's really a data chain here and any of these, uh, several of these steps are optional. You don't have to use them so it's quite flexible in what we do. There is a special form of XMLIs X3D called canonical. Canonical means there are strict formatting rules. That's okay. Authors don't have to do that. The tools take care of it. The idea here is that if we have one HTML with some spaces in it and the other with not so many spaces in it, they're the same page. Why would we distinguish between them? Canonicalization says before you sign before you compress, before you uh, encrypt, get rid of the parts that don't matter. Format it in a given order. In our case, we format in the order that makes the best performance when you read it back. And then two similar scenes that are functionally equivalent will actually get written out the same way. And you'll end up with the same file, and that's a good thing. Okay, what's left? Well. That's our whirlwind tour of, of the technology in there. I think you have the background or the extra level of detail to understand the nodes that are going on. How does X3D work? We've tossed in a few more resources here at the end. We've got a mailing list page here. If you want to get other help or ask questions, the public mailing list is a great place to do that. You can sign up. You can also uh, join Web3D and be part of it. You could help us with some of our uh, liaisons. Uh, our X3D Earth effort is uh, working closely with the Open Geospatial Consortium. We just finished our 10th anniversary symposium. Very happy about that. We expect to be in uh, Germany next spring, spring of 2009, probably back to back with Eurographics, maybe a week earlier. Uh, we just held the SIGGRAPH conference. Uh, we had several each year, so there are multiple ways to get involved and uh, see what's going on. Let's summarize that. We gave in this chapter a technical summary and a political summary of what's the history of X3D. How is it put together? Why is it put together? And what can you do with it? So uh, hopefully if you came to X3D from another technology, this gives you a better feel for how it relates to the things that you're comfortable with and how you could start using X3D maybe not as a replacement, maybe simply as a way to get your work from your tools out onto the web where others can see it. Okay, so the best thing to do is get going on examples and that's what chapter two does. At the end of each uh, uh, slide set we will list references used and other helpful resources that might help you go forward in your work. Uh, the first couple are consistent. Of course, these slides are supplementary material for the book, X3D for Web Authors. We uh, maintain an authoring tool, X3D Edit. We have hints for authors. Of course, the specification is a constant resource. The Bible, the Bible of computer graphics, uh, Historically, at least, it's been uh, computer graphics, principles, and practice, uh, lovingly referred to as Foley and Van Damme. Uh, 
but a lot's happened since there. Uh, I saw Steve uh, Feiner about a year ago and uh, introduced some students to him and said, yeah, yeah, he's one of the co-authors of the Bible. And Steve quickly corrected me and said, no, 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 the Old Testament. So good line there. Yeah, graphics is, continues to move very quickly. Uh, XML in 10 points. Thank you, Bert, for writing that. And uh, if you wanted some second or third opinions of the book, we tossed them in there, too. Hope you enjoy X3D. Have fun. See you in Chapter 2.